Okay, hi everybody. I'm going to uh, unmute everyone, but you can always unmute yourselves later. I hope you're all well. Um, and I hope that our internet works today for that matter. Uh, we are studying, uh, before we go into our discussion of, of Parsha's bow, we are learning the Kuzari in the fourth Ma'amar, the fourth essay. And we're gonna, you know, uh, continue our discussion of prophecy, but not for that much longer. Um, I, I do want to go over this paragraph today on page 414 um, that deals with the issue of how God is perceived in different ways by different prophets based on different circumstances that are going on. In other words, sometimes when God wants to be perceived as a benevolent God, he'll be perceived as one image. And when he wants to be perceived as a vengeful God, he'll be perceived as another image. And so, um, and in the course of this just small paragraph that we're going to learn today, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is going to talk about Yechezkel's vision of the chariot, Ma'aseh HaMerkava. Um, and I want us to look at something very interesting about that in just a moment. So the prophets, env the prophets envision him, envision God, as removing, appointing, and judging kings, the thrones arranged, and as an elderly man sitting. Okay, so sometimes God is perceived as a judge, and that's when a prophet is having an image of something that's going to happen where world politics, geopolitics is going to dramatically change. That's because God is in the process of rearranging things as the judge of the world. During a time of God's anger and his contemplation of departure from their midst, the prophets see him as sitting on a lofty and exalted throne with the fiery angels standing over him. Now, this is a quote from Isaiah chapter six. And this is gonna be a pivotal issue for the Abarbanel, who lives a few centuries after Rabbi Huda Levi. Rabbi Huda Levi lives in the um, 11th and, and 12th century, and the Abarbanel lives in the 15th century. So as we're going to see in a minute, the Abarbanel quotes from Rabbi Huda Halevi on this very point. But what, but what he's saying is, is that when a prophet has a vision of God with angels all around him, it's supposed to signify that God is departing from humanity. Now, what's the connection? Why is that considered to be God departing from humanity when God is surrounded by his angels? Can anyone think of a connection? All right, so th think on that for just a moment. And when God actually departs from their midst, prophets see the chariot which Yechezkel envisioned. So according to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, the vision of the chariot, which is in the first chapter of Ezekiel, is really a message to the prophet that he wishes to convey to the rest of the people that God is leaving. God is leaving them. Why? Why is that the message of a chariot? because the chariot is a mode of transportation, right? Exactly. So this, has anyone ever heard this before? This is unique to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. There's so many other ways, and I wanna share this with you today. I find it fascinating. Yechezkel actually had this vision at the time of the exile while he was still in Eretz Yisrael. In other words, the temple had already been destroyed or was in the process of being destroyed. The Jews have already been exiled. Um, by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, but Yechezkel is having the prophecy while still in Eretz Yisrael. Now, the reason why we need to point this out, why Rabbi Huda Halevi is sort of emphatic about this point, is because for Rabbi Huda Halevi, where is the only place in the world where a human being can experience prophecy? In Eretz Yisrael. So even though we know that Ezekiel spent a large portion of his life in the diaspora, post temple destruction, post exile, you have to conclude that he had this vision while he was still in Israel, and then he left Israel and conveyed his vision to the masses. And he preserved it in its entirety in his thoughts and brought it with him outside of Eretz Israel, the place of prophecy. 
And then he, he just adds for, for good measure that the boundaries of Eretz Yisrael are detailed in the Torah as from the Sea of Reeds, the Yam Suf, until Yam HaPlishtim, the Philistine Sea, and from the desert to the river. Included within these are the Sinai Desert, Seir, Paran, and even Egypt. And what Rabbi Yehuda Levi is adding for good measure is that in the event that you find a prophet, a prophet having a prophecy outside of what you and I may identify as Eretz Yisrael, it's possible that there are more extensive boundaries for Eretz Yisrael as far as prophecy is concerned. That's, yes. Daniel seems to have, prophe- have had prophecies in Eretz Yisrael, and Rabbi Yehuda Halevi has dealt with that as well. Anytime you find that a prophet prophesies outside of Eretz Yisrael, it's either because he started in Israel and sort of had that power sort of travel with him, or he's having a prophecy for the sake of Eretz Yisrael. Sometimes, and I don't remember what he says specifically in the case of Daniel. There are those who hold that Daniel was not actually a real prophet, but was a visionary and it had near prophecies. So I'm not sure what we'll say in the case of Daniel. Okay. Um, in any event, this really helps us launch into a discussion that the, Abarbin, the Abarbanel has an extensive introduction to, the, to his commentary of the book of Yechezkel. And I've really tried my best to shorten it as much as possible. But I wanted to share with you the, that the Abarbanel has this fascinating sort of summary of how the different commentaries have understood the vision of the chariot. It's a very, very stylized vision of this chariot that has four faces on all, on each side of the chariot, there's a different face. And Yechezkel, and it has a chariot with galgalim, with wheels, and there's chashmal, there's flashes of light in this vision. And there's so much mystery that this uh, is shrouded in to the point where our sages say, that you're really not supposed to expound on the Ma'aseh HaMerkava in a public venue. You're not supposed to. And one of the things that the Abarbanel says is that I have no qualms about explaining to you what this vision is all about because I'm not delving into Kabbalah. As a matter of fact, says the Abarbanel, I'm not a Kabbalist. I haven't studied Kabbalah. He says that he admits that readily. He says, I haven't studied that part of the secrets of of mysticism. I'm just trying to understand the simple meaning of the text, which is, if it's good enough for the Abarbanel, it should be good enough for us as well. And so in, in, in the course of giving this extensive introduction, let's just, let me share my screen with the people who are in TV land. Um, so that you at least can see a little bit of the screen. I hope you can see it. And he says, he's got a series of introductions to the book of Yechezkel. He says, my second introduction introduction is to try and explain the vision that Yechezkel had at the beginning of his visionary experience. And that it is repeated multiple times in the first chapter and subsequent chapters. It's also mentioned at the end of his prophecy. Our rabbis call this the chariot, the vision of the chariot. He says, because God appears in this vision in a chariot in the same way that you would typically find a king traveling with his entourage in a chariot. Just like in many kings' chariots are drawn by four beasts of burden, and it is on wheels. 
עליהם מושב אחד ועליו הכיסא אשר יושב עליו המלך. And it's constructed in such a way where the chariot rests on the wheels that is drawn by these animals, and that's where the king is seated. Kain ra'ah ha'navi, arba chayot sh'ayu nohagot ha'merkava, and that's really what Yechezkel envisioned. He sees four animals leading the chariot. That's how he understands the four faces on the chariot. And the wheels that are allowing the, the chariot to move. And there's more mystery to this vision because it is held, it is the, the chariot is in the heavens and the heavenly realm, resting upon uh, uh, um, angelic beings. And there seems to be a vision of a man on the chariot as well. The prophet readily admits that this vision is purely happening epistemologically, meaning in the mind. It's not happening. There was no actual uh, uh, physical vision that he has of it. And that's why so many of our great sages, both in earlier generations and in later generations, have tried to figure out what is the meaning of this image. All of the angels that are surrounding God in this chariot, their wings are described, their hands and feet are described. What is the meaning of all of it? What are the wheels? What is the heavenly firmament where the chariot is ensconced? What is the meaning of the seat of the chariot and the flashing light? So, I note that there are three basic sort of, um, uh, what would you say, three basic approaches to what the, uh, what the vision of the chariot is. One is our sages, the rabbis of the Talmud and the Midrash. The second is the way of the Maimonides, who uses a philosophical approach, explaining that using Aristotelian philosophy, that this is a message for how the world operates or how God operates the world from his heavenly realm and manipulates creation. And the Hagimel, and the third is Hapshat The third is to try and make sense of this by saying that it's a reference to the four kingdoms that traditionally have subjugated the Jews, you know, uh, Bavel, Madai, Yavan, and Rome, and Rome. So those are the four kingdoms, and that's what's being alluded to in the four faces of the chariot. And as a matter of fact, that's how Christian scholars have interpreted the story in Yechezkel as well. And I expound on that approach in my commentary to the book of Daniel. I'm now going to try and express to you what these three approaches basically are. So I'm not sure if we're going to go through all of them. Uh, I've tried to whittle it down, but even with my abridged, it's a, it's a lot of text. Let, let's see how much we can get through. So he says the first approach, which is based on our tradition from the rabbis, our rabbis tell us that this entire vision is a reference to the angelic beings that are completely disembodied 
and that perform God's will in heaven. That's the first approach, okay? Hadera Hasheni, second approach is by Maimonides, who says that it has to do with the workings of using Greek philosophy, using Aristotelianism, explaining that this is all a vision to explain how God manipulates and operates the world. Um, and he goes into basically explaining how it's really all about metaphysics and explaining how Hashem using different, um, like for example, the four faces on the chariot are the four base elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. This is all explained by the Rambam in Moreh Nebuchim at the very beginning of the third section, which in our Moreh Nebuchim class, we will get to in maybe a month or so, maybe a couple of months, we'll see when we get to it. But we're almost, we're, we're getting close to the end of the second part of Moreh Nebuchim, but we haven't reached this part yet, which is at the beginning of the third section. He says, um, he says, Vahadat hazeh. and he says, oh, he basically says um, that, uh, he says that there's also a primordial matter that is being referenced by this, but it's really the way the Rambam understands it. It's really all just a, a, a detailed vision about how the universe interacts with God on using so, really like the science of its day, using that as an interpretation. He says, um, this is something that's been accepted by many Jewish philosophers who follow the Maimonidean model, lo chen anochi omdi, she chokhmat harabu machashavto bazeh me'en me'en daiti l'kabla v'hirachokam mimeni. He says, the Abar Benel, by the way, is a big fan of the Rambam, but he says, in this respect, I can't accept it. I cannot accept what the Rambam writes. It is too far from the simple import of the text and I guess what he's, his point is the Rambam has gone overboard in his philosophical um, superimposition uh, over the biblical text. And then he gets to the third. He says, He says, the third approach is that this is all about the four kingdoms that have traditionally subjugated the Jews. In Yano Shekvar Hitba'er Shenev Uchadnetzar Melech Bavel, so therefore, contextually, this is that Ezekiel is having his prophecy at the time when King Nebuchadnezzar has already besieged the land of Israel and Jerusalem. The Yehoyachin Melech Yehuda Yatsa Elav Hu Vimo Abadav Esarisav, King Yehoyachin of Judea has already been taken into exile, and etc. 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 He says, Yehoyachin has already heard from the prophet Yirmiyahu, who lives before Yechezkel, that the kings of Israel are going to be the subjects and are going to be servants to the Babylonian king. He says, and when Yehoyachin hears this, he also recognizes that the Jews are living this, this very Pollyannish life of thinking that everything is great because they're still in, in Jerusalem. They think that they're their own independent kingdom. They're under the reign of the next king, Tzidkiyahu, who's merely a vassal of King Nebuchadnezzar. Haya Yehoyachin v'chol hagolim ito atzavim v'doagim u'mitchartim ma'od. So Yehoyachin is very distressed and all of the people that have already been taken into exile by Nebuchadnezzar for resisting his um, domination have sort of been whisked away. And they're very upset because they see what's about to happen. Whereas the Jews themselves are living, are oblivious to all of this domination that is coming upon them by Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. So this prophecy comes to Yecheskel as he's with Yehoyachin in the exile 
in order to offer comfort to those who have already been exiled. And to let them know that don't think that life is going to go on for the people in Yerushalayim and that you're the only ones who've been exiled. Realize that it's in just a matter of days or weeks or, or months or whatever it is, all you will be joined in the exile by the rest of Klal Yisrael. So don't think that you're the only ones who've been in exile and everyone's going to be fine in Eretz Yisrael. Realize that this, you have just been the first wave of, of, uh, of Golos and that there are going to be more waves of Golos because Nebuchadnezzar is going to destroy the temple. So he says, And then the Abarbanel goes further into this discussion and basically says that part of Yechezkel's vision, according to this approach, is that Nebuchadnezzar is only the first of a series of kings who are going to subjugate the Jewish people and, and, and uh, place us in this exilic existence. And he says, therefore, this vision that Yechezkel has, according to this approach, is the same vision that Avraham had at the Brit Ben Abitarim, where God shows, tells Avraham to take different animals and to dismember them and to go between the cut pieces. And as the Medrash tells us, these animals represent the four different kingdoms of oppression. And it's the same vision that Yaakov had when he sees the vision of the ladder. Because according to one version of the Midrash, the angels going up and down the ladder represent the angels of the different kingdoms that are going to be oppressing the Jewish people. And Shlomo HaMelech also had a similar prophecy, it's, uh, you know, and so forth. And the Abarbanel says that the fact is this approach is viable. It's consistent with the context of Ezekiel's other prophecies about talking to the Jews who are in exile and offering them words of consolation, that this is how Jewish history is going to unfold. But don't worry, the redemption will come at the end of all of this suffering. Um, and it, um, it's perfectly legit, basically, he says. However, aval ani b'makom hazeh rotsa lamar b'viur sefer yechezkel, natiti mimenu mipnei shtei sibot. But I, Rabbi Yitzchak Dana Barbanel, to have decided to digress from that approach because I have two problems with it. We're not going to go into the difficulties that he has with that issue, but we're going to go and he says, I'm going to tell you my approach. And he quotes Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. He then, in other words, he basically says, in order to present to you my version of what this vision is, I first need to quote to you from Rabbi Yehuda Halevi in the Kuzari, who says that whenever a prophet sees God surrounded by angels, that text is an allusion to the fact that God is departing from man. Because the angels, so he, he explains like this, he says, um, and, and he basically says, um, he says, that prophets see God in different visions, as in different guises. And the reason is, is because each vision, each prophetic vision, is a depiction of God in how he's about to behave. And therefore, like in the book of Daniel, where God is depicted as sitting in judgment, it's because he's in the process of changing from one government to another. God is sort of judging and rearranging world, world geopolitics. And sometimes they'll see God in a state of anger because the nation Israel has disobeyed him. And because God is thinking about removing his divine presence from the people, 
Bashara Yeshaya Tashim Yosheva al Kisei Ram Vinisa, Ki ilu Hayam Mitrahe Kashka Khatomehem. It's because why is God surrounded by his angels in an exalted throne up in heaven? Is because God is pulling away. It's basically an allusion to the fact that I'm elevating myself, I'm ascending from where you reside, O man. I'm placing my throne on an elevator and departing from you. You're on the ground floor, and I, God, am ascending up to the up high. He says, and that's why you find that God's entourage of angels also surround him on up high, as is depicted in the book of Isaiah. It's as if to say, the angels that I had appointed to surround you, O Jewish people, and to protect you, they have also departed, and they have come with me up to the heavenly realm. And that's what scripture means in, say, for Yeshaya, when it says that God's seraphim were standing all around God. In other words, according to the Abarbanel, it's not a depiction of the angels for the sake of the angels. It's a depiction of the angels to indicate to man that you've lost your angels because they've come up now to be with me. And that's Yechezkel's vision of God leaving the Jewish people at the time of the Churban. And that's why the Medrash says that at the time of the destruction, it was not a, 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 um, an overnight event of God's departure of the Shekhinah, but rather it, there were 10 different uh, stops that God made in the course of departing from the Jewish people at the time of the, of the Churban. Ki ilu ra'ah ha-merkava muchenet lalechet bahamelech Hashem tzivakot. He says, and that's Yechezkel's vision. He sees God in the process of preparing to go on a journey to leave the Jewish people. And that's the idea, is that just like a king, when he's going to be traveling from his palace to go to some other destination, he will get on his chariot. And therefore, this is purely metaphorical, this vision. And that's why Yechezkel sees the four uh, faces on the chariot. He sees the wheels in order to just give a comprehensive uh, metaphor. asher itanu. Just like a, a conventional uh, king's chariot has four animals to draw it and it has wheels. So that's the message that the Abarbanel wishes to leave us with. And that's pres- and this Chiddush originates in Rebbe Yehuda Halevi's Kuzari. I thought that this was fascinating because it's very easy to skip over this paragraph and not realize that Rebbe Yehuda Halevi really forms the foundation of the Abarbanel's entire understanding of Maasei Merkava. And it's Rebbe, the Abarbanel's commentary is, is a very important commentary on the book of Yechezkel. So for those of you who might have found that interesting, I'm, I'm glad and just, just maybe store that in your data banks, that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is the foundation for the Abarbanel's narrative of Maasei Merkava. And this is where we'll hold it in the Kuzari for today. Let's get to some ideas, any comments or questions um, about Maasei Merkava. Yes, Elaine. Yeah. Yes, so so the Abarbanel understands that the vision of angels is purely metaphorical, and that it, it's a, it's an it, it, 
Well, I shouldn't say that it's purely metaphorical. In other words, the idea of an angel is something that's probably most commentaries agree upon. It's some kind of intermediary force that God sends into our world in order to have his will be done. When we talk about, for example, um, God said after we left Egypt, I'm going to send an angel before you to watch over you on the road. So what does that mean? God is sending an angel to watch us on the road. In other words, he's going to create protective boundaries around us that will guide us, the cloud cover, the fire pillar. Those are all God's angels, so to speak. They are intermediary forces that God sends our way to protect us, to guide us, and so forth. And, and so the word malach should not only be perceived as a, a, a being with angels, uh, with uh, wings and a, a white cloak and things like that. It's really, it's used generically to describe any, any kind of intermediary uh, power that God sends to the world in order to have his will done. So the image of angels in the guise of flying creatures with wings and so forth, that part is metaphorical because it's all an indication that all of those protective forces that God had sent to protect the Jews while the temple was standing, everything was being recalled back, back to Hashem. And that's the entourage that God is surrounded with in heaven. Yes, Mrs. Sachachevsky. Yes. Basically, that's right. That's another way of putting it. How much divine providence God is investing within the Jewish people. So when, yeah. It, it seems overly simplistic is, is what you're saying, is that if it, this profound vision that Yecheskel is having, which we traditionally believe is filled with so much esotericism and depth and mysticism, according to the Abarbanel, is really just the depiction of God departing from the Jewish people and removing his divine providence from them. And you're saying that he's oversimplifying something that's very deep. Well, the, so, so yeah, so that's the, the Barbanel is suggesting that that's the simple understanding. Now, when you go into the details of that vision, the different kinds of angels that are described and the reason why the, the text describes it in so much detail, we'd have to go into the details of the Abarbanel's commentary to find out what each detail really means in the course of that, of that overarching depiction. However, um, you know, it's, uh, he, and, and that's why in the course of his commentary, he says, I have no problem expounding on the first chapter of Ezekiel, even though our sages tell us not to do it publicly, because I know that there's depth here, and I'm not I'm not going into that depth. I'm just trying to give you the surface meaning of the text. Okay, Linda has a question or a comment, please. I see your hand up. Okay, it's up to you, Linda. I'm not, uh, if you wanna unmute yourself. Can you hear me there? Yep, now we can hear okay, you. Sorry, sorry. Um, I just don't really, so my question is, I guess, if, if the point of prophecy is for the people correct yes like yes. so so why not like if the point is to transmit the idea that god is leaving for whatever the reason is at that point in time why if we are having we now we're having and the commentaries are having so many discussions about what it actually means why would it be why is it so complicated like why not just state the image that he sees as now God is leaving for whatever reason, instead of all this, you know, depth of trying to understand it, because how could the people really 
possibly understand any of that if we we now are having so much you know discussion about what it all means it sort of seems like it defeats the purpose of the prophecy in other words rub a dub dub thanks for the grub and or or, or yecheskel could have just said uh i saw god telling me i'm out of here instead of having all of this visionary uh, uh, richness and all of this uh you know all of the yeah all of the elaborate imagery Right, that's really what you're asking, I believe. Yeah, but because I think they might, I mean, yeah. wouldn't. And I, I, I think, I think the answer, the Abarbanel would probably be ready to admit is that there's much more depth here than just the surface meaning of the text, um, and that there are multiple layers of complexity to a prophetic vision. Um, uh, you know, the 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 Rambam is very fond of quoting the verse in the book of Mishlei, the book of Proverbs. Which the rabbis translate to mean is that sometimes you can create artwork where which has a surface vision of the artwork. And then if you look more carefully at the artwork, there's something that's inlaid behind the surface that you can only tell when looking at it much more carefully. And God has this technique of providing communication to man, which has multiple levels of, an, of understanding. There's a surface understanding, and then there's a much deeper level of understanding. All the Abarbanel is providing us with right now is the surface understanding. Full disclaimer, he says, there's much more depth here, and that's probably why there's so much more visionary richness to the simple message of, I'm out of here, okay? Uh, so let's talk, let's continue our discussion of angels when we talk about Parsha's bow. There is a very uh, uh, important question that is a glaring contradiction in the narrative, at least according to our sages. And it's something that we go over every year at the Seder. And it, you may have even had this question raised at the Seder because in the text of the Haggadah, the Haggadah itself um, um, sort of contradicts itself if you look at the text and with this discriminating eye. In Parshat Bo, we read about the actual Exodus and the, the, all of the events that lead up to the Jews leaving Egypt, including Makas Bechoros, including the, the plague of the firstborn. In, and this is all in chapter 12 and of Exodus. And in chapter 12, verse 12, the Torah says, I will pass over Egypt on this night. I will smite every firstborn in the land of Egypt. From man unto beast. And among all the gods of Egypt, I will do wonders. I am the Lord. Now, Rashi commenting on why it says, I am the Lord, why do you have to say that? Ani ba'atzmi velo al yedei shaliach. What does Rashi say? And this is echoed in the Haggadah. Rashi is merely just quoting from the Mechilta, from the Midrash. It says, I by myself, says God, I'm doing this on my own, not via proxy, not via intermediary. It's me, ani velo shaliach. Ani velo malach, I am not an angel. Does those words sound familiar to you from the Haggadah? Right? Okay, great. Ani velo saraf, exactly. Okay. Ten verses later, Pasuk Yud Chaf Bet. What does God say? Ulakachtem agudat ezov. Take a hyssop brush. Utfaltem badam asher basaf and dip it into the blood that's in your pail or your bucket, which you're using to paint the doorposts. Paint the lintel and the doorposts with the blood that is in the bucket. And you, Jewish people, do not leave Do not leave your doorways of your houses until morning. Why can't I walk outside, Hashem? Why not? 
So Rashi says, "Va'atem lo teitzu, magid shemeachar shenitna rishut lemash lemashchit lechabel eno mavchin ben sadik lerasha." This teaches us that once God has granted permission to the destroyer angel to destroy, he does not distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. Okay? And nighttime is the time for destroying angels. As it says in Tehillim, that in the nighttime is when all of the beasts of the wild or the wild animals roam. Okay? So, what is the apparent inherent contradiction over here? Can anyone just say it, even though it may be glaring for many of us? What is the inherent contradiction? Go ahead. Is it is it Hashem or is it the Malach HaMavis that's bringing Makas Bukharos? And if it is Hashem, Ani Ba'atzmi Velo Al Yedei Shaliach, I myself and not via proxy, what is the function of painting the doorposts? Is the function of painting the doorposts to um, have the Jews identify themselves before God? Why does God need people to identify themselves? It's one thing if you were to tell me that God created a destroyer angel to wipe out the firstborn of Egypt. So maybe the destroyer angel would require some identification of which houses to skip over. But if it's Hashem himself, then why do you need the Jews to paint their doorposts? You could argue that painting the doorposts is for the Jews themselves. They should see the sig signification of their house being a protected house because they are God's people. But why then can't they walk outside? Why not walk outside? It's God. God is the one who will discriminate between Jew and non-Jew. If he can discriminate between firstborn and non-firstborn, why can't he also equally discriminate between Hebrew and Egyptian? Excellent question. Mrs. Sachachevsky is additionally asking, what does Rashi mean, quoting from the Midrash, that once God allows the destroyer angel to destroy, he doesn't distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. Isn't everything based on hashkacha pratis, on divine providence? Oh, so you could say that when a person is not completely righteous, God removes divine providence and a person has to be careful. All right, well, you're, 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 on your way towards trying to figure this out. The fact of the matter is, is that divine providence is a sliding scale, right? That's the way the commentaries understand it. The more of a tzaddik you are, the more you can expect God to be there for you, even to the point of being a miraculous manifestation. But if a person's not a tzaddik gum or a total tzaddik, then the level of providence that they have could be limited. And so therefore, no person can ever say, I'll cross the street and while my eyes are closed, I won't have to worry about getting hit by a car or a bus because God will protect me. No, that's you don't deserve that level of divine providence, right? So therefore, if there's something dangerous outside, don't go outside, right? Because there's something dangerous, even if you're righteous. But then how do we understand the previous statement that it's ani ba'atzmi velo al yedei shaliyah? I, yeah, I mean, I hear you, but if this is the night of the redemption, we wouldn't expect God to be removing himself, right? Okay, there are multiple approaches to this thorny subject. We'll start with the Ramban, and then we'll work our way through. I want to get, I wanted to finish with the Zohar. So because our time is limited, we may need to uh, skip a little bit. So the Ramban on, in his commentary over here to Pasuk Chafalot says, 
Shalo yetsu mi petach betam balailahu. God warns the Jews, you may not leave your houses on that night. Lefisha hakadosh baruchu over bimitzrayim, kemelech she over mi makom lemakom. It's because on that night, God himself was passing through Egypt. Uspek lot, uspek latorim lefanav, shelo yifka bo adam velo yistakel bo. I'm not sure that's probably a Greek word, but it means that God's, um, his, uh, his guards, God has guards, you know, just like when a king is walking through the street, he has bodyguards to protect him. He's got the secret service um, to protect him. God came to Mitzrayim with his secret service to make sure that no one would try to step in God's way, so to speak, or do anything to, uh, to impinge upon God's turf, or even to look upon God, because when God is present in Egypt, there's a certain holiness that requires a certain uh, creating of distance from the Almighty himself. If the Shekhinah was coming down into Egypt that night, so it required a certain distancing from the Shekhinah. <speaking in Hebrew> As Zechariah talks about that when God descends, all of his holy ones descend with him. God has an entourage. That's the same vision that Moshe had when he asked to see God's glory. God says, I have to, I have to conceal you. You have to be concealed when I pass my glory over you. To protect the viewer from the incendiary angels and the entire entourage of God that will be zealous on God's behalf to push away mortal man who is coming too close to the spectacle. The kevin shematzinu b'sha shenitna rishut l'mashchit l'chabel she'eno mabchin b'in tzadik l'rasha and because there's no difference in this regard between the righteous and the wicked, meaning that when it comes to God's glory, you can't take liberties. You know that story of um, of the man as they as they were coming back from uh, from uh, bringing the ark back from captivity from the Philistine capture. They were bringing it back, and this man sees the ark starting to to tip to tip over on the wagon, and he puts out his hand to try and stop it, and he dies immediately. Right, so even though his intentions were noble and virtuous, but when it comes to divine glory, there is no distinction between the righteous and the wicked. And that's what the medrash means when it says no Jew was permitted to go out that night, because if the wild um, angels who represent the secret service of God, who are going to immediately uh, disarm and eliminate any threat that comes too close to Hashem. So that's the reason why. And it's not a contradiction, therefore. God says, Ani velo malach, I'm coming to Egypt, but my entourage is coming with me. And therefore, you can't go outside because you cannot gaze at, at the Shekhinah and anyone who tries to will be eliminated by my heavenly fiery angels. Um, you have a, a slightly different commentary, um, but it's a similar idea that the Moshav Zikanim, which is the Tosafists have, that the idea here is um, that God brought an entourage with him, that, and his entourage, which was basically God started the, he comes down to Egypt to supervise the plague of the firstborn, but he brings his entourage with him to carry out the actual death penalty. And that entourage would not have distinguished. The Pnei Yehoshua suggests a similar idea, but he says something totally different at the same time. The Pnei Yehoshua in his commentary to the Talmud, and the Pnei Yehoshua lives in the uh, early 18th century, and he says that, um, uh, that, that uh, in reality, there's a Gemara that says that a person should never walk outdoors at night. 
Why should you never walk outdoors at night? Because it's dangerous, not only because you could uh, be, be mugged by uh, human uh, burglars uh, or, or robbers, you could be attacked by a wild animal, you could, but you could also be attacked by spiritual forces that linger at nighttime that could harm you. So therefore, when Hashem says, He was not referring to the nefarious forces that were going to kill the firstborn, because in reality, Hashem himself was taking care of eliminating the firstborn. Hashem himself would have been able to determine the difference between a Jew and a non-Jew. But Hashem was teaching the Jewish people a general principle. Do not walk outside at night because there are other forces that are prevalent every night of the year, not just the night of the redemption. That's how he understands the verses. The Chatam Sofer says, and, uh, and I'm just going through it very quickly because I want to get the, to the Zohar. The Chatam Sofer says, my interpretation is that God would never directly kill any human being, even the Egyptian firstborn. So when we say that God says, Ani velo malach, Ani velo shaliach, it's I, God, who am wiping out the firstborn, it doesn't literally mean that God was taking the lives of the firstborn. What God was doing is that he was weakening the spiritual force of Egypt that was protecting the firstborn. Egypt itself had spiritual power, and God subdued the spiritual power of Egypt, the Egyptian uh, astrological uh, force that was protective of Egypt up until that point, and that weakened the Egyptian uh, uh, spiritual power, and that allowed the angel of death to go then and smite the firstborn. So when it says that God was the one who came into Egypt by himself, God subdued the celestial forces that were protecting Egypt. And then the Malach Hamavis, or the destroyer angel, who once he's given permission to destroy, but does not distinguish between the good and the bad, would have been able to kill Jews as well if the Jews had not been careful. So that's another approach. They're all very similar in the way that they try to reconcile these two ideas. The last thing I want to show you, which to me is very meaningful, and I hope to develop this idea for my drasha for Shabbos, is from the Zohar. The Zohar says, we'll just read it inside for just a moment. Ta come and see. Bishaita didina shari ba'alma, that whenever um, strict justice is being meted out in the world, ha'itmar deloliboy lebarnosh li'ishtak chabeshuka, it has already been taught that a human being should not go outside and be out in the public. Because once justice is being meted out, the destroyer angel does not distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. Therefore, a person should not be out in the public's sphere. The begain kach, and it was therefore taught that it is for this reason, istim Noach bateva, that Noach was told by God to seclude himself in the ark. What does that mean? Hashem told Noach that you need to go in an ark because even though theoretically God could have saved Noach by putting him in a cave and just making sure that the cave was waterproof with all of the animals. But God said, no, Noah, you need to seclude yourself and not be out in the open. God could have created a protective barrier around Noah to protect him. No, you need to hide from the rest of humanity because humanity is being destroyed. And therefore you cannot appear out in public. When judgment is being meted out. Similarly, the Jews were told you may not leave your houses until judgment is meted out. And and this is the, the big kicker also, not just Noach, and it is for this reason, Vayomer Himalait al Nafshecha al Tabit Acharecha. 
What is that last verse from? Can someone tell me? Yes, Lot and his wife in Parshat Vayera. Why did, what did the angels tell Lot? Flee and don't turn around. Now, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Hashem is destroying Sodom and Amorah. And therefore, you cannot be prevalent. You cannot be there when your neighbors are being destroyed. But it's not just that you cannot be there. What I believe that this Zohar is teaching us is a very profound idea. God was saying to the Jewish people, I am going to smite all the firstborn. But you, as B'nai Yisrael, do not have permission to witness what is happening. Just like I told Lot and his family that they could not witness the destruction of Sodom, you, the Jewish people, may not leave your homes because you may not gaze upon the destruction. What's the comparison? Just like Lot and his family were being saved, not because of their righteousness, but rather because of God's desire to, um, basically Lot and his family had protexia because they were Avraham's family. It's not so, it's, and therefore you don't have a right to gaze upon the destruction of other people that you should have been a part of because you yourselves are not righteous enough to deserve salvation. Similarly, the B'nai Yisrael were also idolatrous at this time. They were not all tzaddikim. They didn't deserve to be spared the plague of the firstborn. And there's a very valuable lesson here, which I hopefully will develop at some point this week. And that is that we all have this natural, there's a looky-loo instinct within people, right? You drive down the highway and you see someone in an accident. You immediately, the rubberneckers, right? You immediately want to see what's going on. There's a fascination that we have about other people's tragedies. We want to know, how did he die? What happened? What are the details? We all want to know that. The reason why we want to know it is because of our own psychological insecurities that there but for the grace of God go I. But the point that is also really important to bring out here is that Hashem says, don't gaze on another person's suffering when the same thing could have just as easily happened to you. And that's part of the lesson that the Jewish people are being given as they're leaving Egypt, because Hashem is telling them, it's not that you are so righteous that I am saving you and choosing you as my people. I have already chosen you based on my covenant with the, with the Avot. But you have to realize that you do not become, you have to remember, not, do not become prideful because of your salvation. There but for the grace of God go you. And that's an important lesson unto itself that Hashem is teaching B'nai Israel that despite the fact that I'm doing so much to save you, realize you don't have a right to look upon the destruction of others. We're going to hold it here for today because it's getting late. Any final uh, comments or questions that anyone would like to make? All right. Have a wonderful week, everybody. And we will, let me just see if there's anything. In there. Um, oh, yes. Uh, did Hashem destroy Sodom and Amora, or did he send an angel to do so? Since you just mentioned one of our sources says, Hashem is incapable of destroying any human being. Very good question. Um, and the answer is, is that it seems that Hashem, well, even though the Pasuk says that Hashem rained down upon Sodom and Amora, the Chatam Sofer would say that it was via an angel. Okay, take care, everyone. Have a great week.